Hey everybody, it's great to be here. Sorry about the technical difficulties with the timer being a little bit weird there. Uh, really uh, glad that you were able to come on a Thursday evening. We're going to be uh, doing a demo lesson today about digital citizenship. Uh, so next week is the official digital citizenship week. So I thought it was a good time to roll out a potential lesson plan. And the lesson plan that I'm going to show you will also be in the video description. So you're free to take it, modify it, use it however you'd like. And really my intention with the lesson today is to talk a little bit about the program. So I'll show you some of the behind the scenes. I'll take questions about any of the programs that I'm using. And then I'm also going to show you what it looks like from the student end. So we'll do a little bit of behind the scenes, kind of pull back the curtain, look at how we would actually set this up and then actually do the lesson and see how it would progress. So um, one change that I'm making just slightly from the previous live show, I'm new to this, is that I am going to take some questions and try to address some questions during the show. So if there are some questions that come up that are relevant to what we're talking about, I'll pull those in. And I'll also have a Q&A at the end if you're not able to, or if I'm not able to get to that question uh, during the session, then I'll also answer those questions at the end. All right, so let's jump in and we're going to take a look today at a digital citizenship lesson live demo. So the lesson that we're going to look at is going to embed some different programs. And this was another thing that I wanted to show. I wanted to just show people how you could take some different programs. I'm just gonna move this around here for a second. and strategically sequence them together. So a lot of the content on my channel is about a single program, but I know that in reality, we're really piecing things together and we need to see how they work in, in logical sequence. So in many ways, this is going to be essentially uh, implementation of a hyperdoc, though the lesson that I'm going to show today is really uh, designed to be implemented in a live synchronous way. There are some uh, different activities in this lesson that you could do asynchronously and I'll point those out. And if anyone has any questions about how to, about sort of which would work better for synchronous versus asynchronous, then definitely ask that question. And yeah, just, uh, just wanna shout out, there's so many people. Uh, it's great to see you, Regina again, and, and Evelyn as well, Sonia. Thanks for being here, Julia, Lauren, Amanda, Alejandra, Minnie B, Juliet, and who else we have in the chat here? Mrs. Uh, Naren. So yeah, great to be here. Thanks so much. And yeah, if you have any uh, questions that come up, please definitely put those in the chat. All right, so this is a Google slide. It doesn't look like a Google slide right now because I just downloaded it as a PDF, but I'm running this lesson out of Google Slides. And I got this awesome autumn themed template from Slides Carnival. So if you haven't checked out Slides Carnival, I definitely recommend that you do. They have uh, these really cool, beautiful templates um, and they brought in some images from Unsplash, which is a great place to get pictures uh, that you have copyright uh, access to. So um, really great resource, Slides Carnival. Okay, so this uh, is again built in uh, the sequence of, uh, or uh, sorry, built in the format of a hyperdoc uh, following the 5e's lesson plan. I always start out a lesson with an essential question um, and then I go into learning targets. So uh, the essential question for this lesson is going to be about sponsored content. Um, so we're going to learn about what sponsored content is and how it relates to digital citizenship. And then when I'm making learning targets for students, I will often break them up into content-based learning targets as well as skill-based learning targets. So in this case, the content, one of the content-based learning targets would be for students to be able to describe um, how they could identify sponsored content. And then uh, we'll also have them be able to actually apply that and identify some articles, some websites that have sponsored content on them. 
And for skill development, students are going to be working on answering comprehension questions on a grade level text, a nonfiction text, um, and then what they'll be producing to show their knowledge is an instructional video that we're going to make in Flipgrid today. And I'm actually going to show you how you could use the app version of that, which is a great option. It's a, a highly functional app. Um, so start with our learning targets and then we're going to move into the engage phase of a lesson. So for the engage phase, uh, in this case, we're going to engage prior knowledge. So given that this lesson is about sponsored content, I wanna see what students already know about this concept of sponsoring something or even this word sponsor. Um, and we're going to build that knowledge in Whiteboard Phi. I'd actually love to hear from people um, whether or not uh, they are familiar with Whiteboard Phi and uh, whether or not it's a program that you've used before, just to kind of know uh, people's familiarity. So if you wanna put that in the chat, uh, that would be awesome as well. Okay, and I do have a question here before uh, moving on. It's, it's actually about how I'm doing this right now. Um, so Diane had a question here about how I'm, how I'm filming this right now. Uh, and so this is, this is not Loom. Um, you could, you can't really live stream with Loom, but it, you could get a similar effect, obviously, with yourself in the corner. This is software called Ecamm. Ecamm is for Mac only. Um, and I am using a green screen behind me. So that's how I'm able to get the different effects with different uh, background screens and then also have myself on top of the uh, um, the lesson that I'm showing. And that's how I make my videos in general uh, with a green screen. But this is Ecamm, it's software that is specifically designed for live streaming. And then you can do different things like set up scenes uh, where I have you know, um, my logo and stuff like that in the bottom corner. All right, um, so we have uh, some people in here, it looks like have used, um, actually most people have not used Whiteboard Phi. So that's great. Whiteboard Phi um, is a really useful program. Definitely recommend that you check it out. Um, so i do one thing on right here really quickly. Whiteboard Phi is essentially a personal whiteboard program uh, that you can access digitally. So if you're the kind of person uh, who uses whiteboards in your classroom, you know, where you have students show you an answer on a board, you're really gonna like this program. Um, it's quite different from a program like Jamboard because it is individual and you have a lot more control over it as a teacher. So if you've used Jamboard before, you know that you have almost no control. Basically everyone has uniform editing access and that means students can overwrite you know, each other's work, even your work. So it's not always an ideal tool to use for education. Uh, Whiteboard Phi is not gonna give us the same collaboration features, but it is going to uh, give us more control and uh, allow us to basically give a student a personal whiteboard. It's totally uh, web-based. It can be accessed from a phone, but it's, uh, it wouldn't be accessed via a separate app. It would just be accessed from the web and it lives temporarily in the program. So each time you create a class, you're just going to essentially create a new whiteboard um, and then you can download it later if you wanna see what you created, but it's not a program where students need to create accounts or anything like that. So what I'm going to do here is set up a new class and I'm just gonna give this our demo class here for we'll do digital citizenship. I don't have enough lines there. Okay. Um, now you can enable a waiting room for students. I would recommend you do this. And this mode is going to be beneficial if you have students that have uh, slower internet connections because it will not co uh, constantly be saving their document. It's just going to help with speed. And you'll find, you'll be able to tell if you're having connectivity issues in this program because there will be a big lag between what students show, what you show on your boards, um, and them not 
uh, syncing up in, in real time. Okay, so I'm going to go here now and click create new class. And that's just going to give me here a class code that I can give to students. Now, before I do that, I'm going to set up my own board here first. So I'm going to go here to toggle my whiteboard. And one option, if you want to create a graphic organizer here, in here, is that you make it directly in whiteboard Fi. You could also bring an image in, so you could create a background in something like Google Slides, and then you could bring it in as a background here. So you have a couple of different options. I'm going to show you how you can make a graphic organizer directly in here. So I'm going to grab this shapes tool, and then what I'm going to do is just copy and paste that a couple of times. All right, and if I need to, I can size it down, change it a little bit here. Okay. And then what I'm going to do up top is add a text box to explain what would be in this particular part of the graphic organizer. So you can do that by going up to this text tool. And remember the objective is for us to just be able to determine what students already know about this word sponsor. So what I'm going to do here um, is just first ask students if they've heard the word. So I'll ask, what do you already know about the word sponsor? And make that just a little bit bigger. And then I'll bring that in over the top here. Oops. Wonderful, okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. Don't know what happened there. It got stuck on my graphic organizer. All right, so we'll do, what do you already know about the word? And then I'll, I'll see if they know something about the word in context. So here I'll ask them something like, um, what they already know about what it means to sponsor somebody. So what do you know about, or I'll, I'll shorten this to say, um, what does it mean to sponsor someone? Okay. And size that down a little bit. Okay. And then for my last one here, I'll do is go ahead and copy and paste this one, make that a little bit faster. Oh, oh now I'm upside down. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. There we go. Okay. <laughs> this is perfect example of what would happen in front of a class, right? You gotta gotta maintain your cool. Okay. Um, all right, so then I'm going to ask them to make a prediction about what they think it would mean to have sponsored content. So we'll start with the word, right, the definition of the word, um, then see if they know what it means in kind of a broader context, and then see if they can identify what it would mean in a more specific context, um, in this case, sponsored content. So same thing, I'll ask that question. What do you think sponsored content means? Okay. Never had this problem with this text getting stuck on the box like this. What is going on? All right, I'm just gonna ask sponsored content just to kind of slow it 
get get us speeded up here because don't know why it keeps getting stuck on the graphic organizer. So it's funny because I chose to show making the graphic organizer in here, which is a function that it has. Usually I make them over in Google Slides, like I explained, and then I bring it in as a background. So, you know, there is a, a maybe a reason why you might want to do that if you're having the same kind of difficulty that I just had there. Okay, um, so I've done that. Now, what I actually want to do here is make this whole thing into a background. So the way that I'm going to do that is by clicking this flatten image icon, and that's going to turn this entire graphic organizer now into the background. So you'll notice like if I took this pen tool that I can just draw right over the top of that. Um, so that's a really useful tool for just making something completely editable um, where you can edit uh, just the, uh, or you can edit directly over a background. Now, if you look at this eraser tool, this also allows you to do something like keep the foreground or clear the foreground, but keep the background. So here I could just delete what I had drawn over the top, but notice that it didn't delete the background. So now it would allow me to mark up all over it and then just delete what I had marked up. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do now is get a student in and you'll see that there's a couple ways students can get in. So there's a QR code here. There's also just a room code that they can enter. So we'll go over here to a student account and we're going to go to whiteboard phi. <clears throat> and the student is going to join a class. So here for the room code, they'll enter the same code, D4968, and they'll join the class. Okay. So they're gonna enter their name, and then when they enter their name, I'm going to be able to see on my end, so if I go here and toggle, that I have a lobby and I have students waiting in the lobby that I can let in. So here I'll accept the student and then you'll see that I'm able to see the student's whiteboard on my screen. Now you'll also notice on the student screen that they can't see my whiteboard. So I have to tell them explicitly to toggle the teacher whiteboard here. So when they click toggle teacher whiteboard, they're going to see that whiteboard that I've already created. And if I click toggle my whiteboard, then I will see mine and I can also see the student whiteboards below. So what I could do here, right, on my poorly put together graphic organizer is do a demo about how students should fill this out. So I could tell students, um, okay, so you're going to say what you already know about the word sponsor. And so I might model here, I'm gonna do the text tool again. I'm going to model by saying something like, um, I've heard of it uh, in the world of sports. So I've heard of people being sponsored if you're an athlete. So I've heard of uh, athletes being sponsored. Okay, so I'll do a little demo and then depending on your lag time, that's going to show up on the student board. So actually right now you notice there was a little bit of lag time, uh, but then it showed up pretty quickly. Now, right now the student whiteboard is blank, right? But if I want them to be able to use this graphic organizer, what I can do here is actually push the graphic organizer out to the student board. So I'll click on push, and then I'm going to push to students, um, and I'm going to push it to them as the background. So now it will pop up on a student's board, and they will have my teacher board with the graphic organizer on their board that they can write on. So then when the student is writing, you know, I'll model the drawing tool here, which obviously isn't ideal, but just to show you something different, 
um, that, you know, maybe they're going to say something like it's when somebody pays for something. I get a lot of, of questions and comments about, wow, you must have a, a stylus for how beautiful you draw with the drawing tool. I, I definitely don't. It's just a, just a mouse and a tracking pad. And I'm, I'm always surprised by that because I think that my, my handwriting is so terrible there. Okay, so you can see in pretty much real time how the student answer will show up on the student whiteboards below. So I can see that. And obviously you can imagine that you have a bunch of students, you can see those answers coming through, right? Now you can click on it and see the student answer up close. And then let's just imagine, I'm not gonna pull up another student account here just for time's sake, but let's imagine that we're on another student account over here. And I want the class to see this because it's a good answer. We wanna all talk about it. I can go to actions and then what I can do is I can push uh, this. So I'm going to push the student answer or sorry, copy the student answer to the teacher whiteboard. So when I click on that, you'll see that it's going to show up now on the whole board. So the student's whiteboard is private, only they can see it, but uh, if you choose to, you can push out an answer to the teacher board so that you could all talk about it. And then you could have them gather responses. So you could say, hey, this is a great answer. You should definitely write that on your board, right? So the idea here is that we're going to build some collective collaborative understanding of what it means to sponsor someone or sponsor something and then get to a place where we're, where we're starting to make some predictions, some inferences about what it would mean to have sponsored content. Okay, I'm gonna uh, pause right there. <laughs> yeah, I love, thank you so much uh, for all these, these questions, all these <laughs> responses that are, <laughs> that are uh, expressing solidarity with, with my tech issues. I, I honestly, I can say I, I, I almost have a, a one major tech issue every single time I do a presentation or a conference. It's, it's, it's pretty hilarious. So I'm very sympathetic and I know it happens to everybody. Um, so yeah, question here, uh, Anne, um, about whether or not it, it works with Chromebooks. It definitely works with Chromebooks. It's web-based um, and free. So you can use it with Chromebooks for sure. Um, and... Question here, uh, Luis, will it be recorded? Yes, so uh, the streams post on my channel the next day uh, and they're viewable on my channel. All right. Okay, great, um, thanks for your questions. All right, um, so let's go back to the lesson. And now what we're going to do is move on from that engage phase and we're going to go into the explore phase. So for the explore phase, students are going to start to learn new content. Um, so today I'm going to show you a program called Actively Learn. Um, again, it would be great just to see if people um, are familiar with Actively Learn. Uh, and I'm also getting a question, Tammy, about Mac compatible. Definitely, yeah, I'm actually using it on a Mac. Um, so Actively Learn is awesome. If uh, you have not checked it out, I definitely recommend that you do. Um, it's a really great program. So what we're going to do here is go over to Actively Learn. And I'm, if I didn't have an account, I could create a free educator account here. Um, but I'm just going to sign in because I already have an account. And you can get a basic plan with Actively Learn for free. They do have paid features. The paid features in Actively Learn are also great. Um, they're going to auto differentiate text for you. So similar to a program like Newzella, where you could push out the same text at different Lexile levels. Um, so really powerful for that reason. Um, but it has great features just with the free version. 
So what I'm going to do here is set up a class um, and you can either bring in a class from Google Classroom or you can just uh, bring in your own. So again, I'll do a digital citizenship just to differentiate here that we're doing a lesson about digital citizenship. And in this case, since I'm not bringing it in from Google Classroom, what it's going to do is just generate a code that I can share with students. Um, and that's gonna allow you to do some pretty uh, powerful report tracking of student data. So let's go back here and go to content. And uh, you'll see there's a huge library of content. So you can look based on curriculum units and topics, news articles, uh, things like that. They also have fiction on actively learn. So you can even get like a full, uh, you know, book on actively learn that you can make into an interactive reading experience. So it's pretty awesome. So there's an article on here um, about sponsored content. I apologize if you can hear the dogs in the background. Uh, it's, that's, that's, that's the life of remote work. Okay, um, so I'm going to pull up this article, uh, Can You Identify Sponsored Content? And what you'll notice here is that every article on Actively Learn already has these interactive questions embedded into the article. Um, so you'll see here that it also has a depth of knowledge um, alignment. It, uh, you can align the questions to standards as well. And these are fully editable. So if you don't want that there, uh, you could delete that question. Now you can also go in and just introduce or bring in your own questions. So let's say, you know, right here that I want to ask students a question. I can just highlight a part of the text, click insert question. And there I can either write a short answer question or I could create a multiple choice question. So you could you know, say something like, uh, what is the main idea of this paragraph? Click save. And I'm just going to not put a standard there for this case. And that just added an interactive question. So similar to a program like Edpuzzle uh, where you're able to chunk up video, Actively Learn is going to allow you to chunk up text. And actually, Actively Learn has a video creation uh, uh, feature as well. So just like Edpuzzle and Nearpod, you can bring in interactive questions to videos that you import. Um, so it's, it's really great. Um, all right, so after I've set this all up, I have all of my interactive questions here for students to answer as they're reading about sponsored content. And notice also applying that idea, right? So this article is set up so that they're actually looking at images, they're finding in this image where there are advertisements to actually start applying this skill um, as they're learning about what it means to uh, have sponsored content. So I'm going to assign this now. I'll assign it to my demo class and then I'll go back here to the student account. <clears throat> and you can give students, since I didn't sign them in through Google Classroom, just a code. Um, so the student will sign in. They're going to sign in with their login. And then I'll share uh, the class code with them and they can come in. <clears throat> okay, so the student is going to go up here to the add button and click join class and then they'll enter that code just like they did with whiteboard phi. <clears throat> click join and there you'll see that they have the article pop directly up in their assignment portal. Now, when the student clicks on this, I'm actually going to pull this all the way over. That's pretty, pretty awesome um, what students see. So a couple of things here. One, if they highlight a word, so that's not a good word to choose, but let's say that they come down to a word, uh, you know, let's just go 
well, just for the sake of argument here, let's do advertisements. And let's say they're unsure what advertisements means. They can pull up a definition of that word. So every word in this article um, has this feature where they can pull up a definition. They can listen to advertisement. The word. They can also translate the word. So they can highlight it and click translate, pick a language and it will translate the word. So really powerful interactive tools that uh, you definitely would want to show students uh, that they can use to help them with their comprehension as they're going through the article. Now, another great or another thing I, I like about actively learn is the fact that it uh, stops the student from moving forward as they're reading. So student is reading, they come to this question that they have to answer. They can't just uh, blow past it. They have to answer the question in order to be able to proceed. So they're answering the question. I just made that up, right? And it's going to immediately tell them whether or not they got it correct. Now, if we go over here back to the teacher end and look here at data, these, once students start doing the assignments, you're going to be able to pull up some pretty rich uh, information about all the standards alignments of the questions. Uh, you know, you can pull up all the data about specific questions that students got right and wrong. Um, and it's all going to come in for you live as well. Um, so that's also a really um, powerful tool uh, and a feature that, that really makes this a, a good tool for education, um, that you're able to pull these pretty dynamic reports and do you can use them to analyze uh, student performance um, and see how students are doing. Now, um, one uh, question that's come up a lot is around this idea of what you actually do when you're, say, in a live session. And I think that we tend to have an inclination to want to spend a live session mostly talking, right? Um, we're in a Zoom meeting or we're in a Google Meet meeting and uh, silence is not maybe so common. Um, but this would still be a great activity to do as a live lesson. You could still have students get in, read the article. Uh, you might want to set up an extension activity so that if some students finish earlier, they have something to do. But that would give you a sense right away of which questions your students are getting right, which ones they're having trouble with, you could intervene right in the moment um, and address any issues that are coming up. So um, I just would want to encourage people to be comfortable with doing something like this where students are just reading and answering questions on their own. They could also pop some questions over to you uh, using a chat feature um, and doing that in, as part of a synchronous lesson. All right, I'm going to look at some of the questions here. Yeah, so this is a good question about how it's different from insert learning. Uh, it is similar. Um, insert learning does not have a feature where, and, and thanks Sonia for the question, it's a, it's a good one. I, I like both tools and I use both tools. Uh, insert learning from my perspective is better for making a web page interactive. You can bring in web pages uh, to actively learn, but the features are, are not quite as rich. Um, and um, it also doesn't allow you to prevent students from blowing through a question. So they could scrub past a question and not answer it. So in some ways, actively learn is maybe better for like a wider range of grade levels, whereas insert learning, I think, requires a higher level of self-management because uh, students are, you know, conceivably going to be able to just skip a question, but very similar in the sense that it makes uh, basically any text interactive. But insert learning is more for web pages. This is more for articles, fiction, nonfiction. Alejandra is asking whether or not it has readings in other languages. Um, I, I don't know. I would need to look into that. Um, I 
it's worth looking into. I don't know, but that's a great question. All right. Okay. Um, so let's move back over here to the lesson. So we can imagine now, right, students have uh, done this uh, activity where they've all built some collective understanding of what it means to uh, sponsor something or someone, what sponsored content is, then they move over and they learn specifically what sponsored content is while reading the article. And they also practice that a little bit, right, um, with some of those interactive questions. So now we're going to take it up a notch. We're going to have students apply that learning. And I love Padlet for this. Padlet is really my go-to online workspace. It's so powerful and keep doing that. Um, allows students, allows you to basically post any type of media uh, to a Padlet board, which is um, what I really like about it. And they also have lots of different formats. I have a video on my channel. Um, it's called 10 Ways to Teach with Padlet that shows how these different types of boards work. Mostly I see the shelf and the wall being used, but you can do mind mapping and make digital interactive maps and stuff like that. So um, Padlet's really great for just collaborative online work. I'm gonna set up a shelf here the shelf system is different from the wall, which is basically just open posting um, because it's going to create columns where students are going to post. So what we're going to do here um, is set up this Padlet. So it says uh, sponsored content and it's going to be a little workspace here. So um, I'll just leave that description blank for now. If you wanted to, you know, you can change the wallpaper color. I'm not going to bother with that right now. Um, I would recommend that you turn on attribution, that you have students create free accounts so that their names show up. You can also turn on the require approval function for uh, extra layer of um, moderation so that you have to check the responses before they come in. All right, so I'm gonna start here on the board. And what I'm going to do here with the first column is have students post about um, what they learned in the article. So we'll have them write about just a little blurb about what they learned in the article they just read about sponsored content. Then we want students to actually go out and start to apply this. So we're going to have students go out and actually find a web page on the internet that has some sponsored content in it. Um, so here they're going to post a web page with sponsored content. And we also, you know, we're going to want to prompt students so we could add a little post below if we wanted, we could do that in the column as well. Just making sure that um, they include an explanation. So we want them to have to say, oops. We want them to have to say how they know, right? Um, what's your evidence that it has sponsored content? And then we could also have them post a page without sponsored content, right? And one of the benefits of <clears throat> creating these columns where <clears throat> students essentially have to work in progression is that it gives students things to do. So one student finishes with this, well, they can move on to the next one you can be commenting, leaving feedback as they're kind of moving in progression through the work. So you could continue to add more columns and kind of add complexity and add challenges if you were concerned with some students kind of blowing through the, the content a little bit faster. Okay, so once we're ready to share this with students, I'm just gonna go up here to share. I'll copy the link. And this will take students directly there. All right, so we have the student board and the teacher board. So a student here could put um, that, you know, what they learned, right? Now, 
they'll see a little awaiting approval because I turned on that notification. So if another student were to log in, they're not gonna see that answer. Um, I can choose to approve it. So let's say I do approve it, right? Um, and I could communicate to students, right? Once I approve yours, then that means it's okay um, to move on to the next uh, column, right? And as the student is, oops, I forgot. Sorry, one thing in the settings that I forgot to do was enable the comments function. Sorry about that. Okay. So one thing I can do as students are then moving on, right, is I can add a comment. So, you know, that's awesome. That's really great, right? Um, and that feedback is going to be more constructive as students are moving through the columns, right? So then what a student can do is go and find a web page that has sponsored content. I'm, I'm going to pull up, I don't know if you're familiar with the news site Daily Beast, but uh, I read it occasionally. It always strikes the, the sponsored content is always really very uh, kind of in your face it, in, in this way that's actually interesting to teach students where it's embedded uh, right into an article. So, you know, you have this whole web page here and they have news stories, but then ah, one of them is this uh, sponsored content article, right? Okay. So let's say that a student finds that they're going to copy that link and then go back to Padlet. And rather than the text tool, they'll go to the link tool here. They'll put the URL and they can write the name of the web page and how they know that it has sponsored content. So I know it has uh, sponsored content because I saw an article that was trying to sell me something, right? Okay, and again, I can approve that, right? Okay, um, so you can imagine as students are continuing to add information to the board that I can continue to comment Right, so that's what I can be doing in this live synchronous work session, um, and then you know have students move over to the next column. Um, this is definitely a lesson that students could do synchronous or asynchronously. So you could post a Padlet and have students do this work uh, outside of class, offline. It doesn't have to necessarily happen when you're there. But what I do like about doing something like this with students all together is that it allows you to give that formative feedback to students. You can correct any misunderstandings right in the moment. And it also kind of, you know, it's um, I think just a good way to use class time that you're actually working and applying uh, what, what you just learned. Okay, I'm gonna check the questions and see if anything's coming up here. Yeah, so this is a question, and this is this is um, about actively learn, but it's a great question. Yeah, so um, sorry, I forgot to mention that, Jim. Uh, you can bring your own articles in, so that's another um, cool feature of actively learn. You can import your own text in, so it doesn't have to be a text that's native um, in actively learn. Great question. All right. Okay, so now we're going to move out of the explain phase. And now students are going to elaborate on what they learned. So here we'll have them apply that learning in a deeper way where they really have to, you know, in some cases work individually, in some cases, uh, work in a group, but they have to do something that shows that they've learned that information. So, you know, if we're thinking also in the sense of I do, we do, you do, this is really fully you do. You're going to go out, you're going to apply this understanding. Um, Flipgrid is a tool I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. It'd be great again to see uh, in the comments how familiar people are with Flipgrid. Um, if it's a tool that you haven't used yet, um, it's 
basically just a program that allows you and students to post short videos and respond to each other in video format. Um, and actually, you know, somewhat, it's kind of interesting, but Flipgrid is a really difficult program in some regards to implement in the classroom. Um, I, I use it in the classroom, but you know, if you can imagine students recording videos of themselves in class, um, it can be tricky and it can be loud. Um, so in some ways it's, it's perfect for remote learning because students can be recording these videos um, and they can do that on their computer. They can also do that on their phones. And I'm actually gonna show the app version in a moment. Um, so what we're going to have students do in Flipgrid here is create a video that is teaching about what they learned. So we're thinking about Bloom's taxonomy, higher order thinking skills, having students produce something, create something, teach other people about something um, is definitely falling under that category of higher order thinking. Um, so what I'm going to do here is log in. Now, if you haven't been to Flipgrid recently, they've changed their format. Um, they now have this topics and group system. Uh, groups you could think of like classes. You could also set them up to be small groups if you wanted. And topics are basically just assignments. Um, so what I'm going to do here is um, set up a group really quickly. So do the same thing that I did in the others. And when you're, sign, when you're creating one for students, you're gonna to wanna to make it private, set this all up so that they have to log in with student emails. I'm going to make it public just um, for ease of getting in right now. You shouldn't do this for students. Um, okay, so created my group. And right now I'm gonna skip this because I'm going to make my own assignment. So I'm just gonna log out of all of that. Okay, and I'm gonna go back here. So for topics, uh, these are basically assignments. And when you wanna create one, you go over here to add a topic and then you can add a title. So we'll do um, digital, or I'm sorry, sponsored content video. And what they'll have to do here is create an instructional or explanatory video about um, what you learned about sponsored content. Now, the more specific you can be here, the better, right? So I could just give a vague instruction like that, that's fine. Um, but your videos are going to be better if you give kids really specific criteria um, and things that they need to include. So for example, uh, you might, you know, have them give a definition, what it, what is it? You might have them give an example. So they could talk about an example that they saw either another student post or um, that they posted themselves. And then you could also add an element that we haven't really brought in yet. And that's to share uh, your opinion about sponsored content, right? What do you, what do you think about it? Okay, now I can change the recording time here. Now this one might be good to have say two minutes or so. You can add all kinds of different media. Recording a video is a really great idea. So you can basically just record a video prompt of yourself explaining the assignment. Um, I'm not gonna take the time to do that right now, but uh, that can also be a way of kind of breaking the ice and showing students that you're willing to take a risk and do that yourself. So I do recommend doing that. You can also just do things like bring in images or GIFs, things like that. Um, but I'm just going to skip that for now and I'll create that topic. Oh, I didn't do something here. Oh, sorry, public, okay. Create topic and now what I want to do um, is I want to add this topic to a group so that I've assigned it. So I'm gonna add this here, I'll go back here, sorry, to, I'll go up here to actions. I will add this to a group. I'll add that to my demo class, digital citizenship, add. Okay, so now when I'm back on my groups, I can share this information again with students. Um, so here, there's a join code um, and I can share this join code. 
Now, I have other videos about uh, using Flipgrid and I always show how to use it uh, on the web-based version. So I wanna show you right now how to use the, um, uh, the app version. So Flipgrid is, has a free app and pull it up here. You can get it from the app store. So you'll see here that this student has already joined a class, right? Um, but in this case, I'm just going to enter that same join code uh, that I had already. Click go. And there the student will see the prompt. They'll see the assignment. Um, and obviously if I made a video or anything like that, they'd be able to uh, make their video here. Okay, um, so now you're gonna see my actual background, my green screen behind me. So when I click on this, I'll uh, join in. <clears throat> okay, so now they have the app, right? Um, and I saw there's a, actually a comment on here about uh, shy students. I'm not sure if this pertains to it. I'm Shane, I'm, but I'm assuming it, it might about Flipgrid. So I'll show you actually something you can do about that. Um, so a student right, can uh, have their screen up. There are all these different options as well. So they can actually bring in other clips. They can you know, make a video somewhere else, bring that clip in, uh, bring in notes. The effects tool is probably the one that they're going to use the most often. Um, so they have different filters, can filter the video in different ways. For shy students, they can use this pixelation tool if they wanted to. Um, so, you know, if they, I kind of sometimes differ. I, I think it's, I think it's good to give students the option to do that. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't always necessarily publicize that because I don't want every face to be pixelated. All right, so I'm gonna pick, pick a filter here and you can obviously go with no filter. Now they also have these different frames. Um, so this one is like a live news frame here with breaking news. See that at the bottom and different types of, you know, cool things. So this is, a lot of this is just kind of fun stuff, right? Um, they do have some other tools that are not just like uh, cosmetic. So they have a text tool so that they could actually type, right, directly on here. Um, so if they wanted to make their video or it's going to be about, sponsored content, they could do that and have that be on the screen and then they can move it around <clears throat> where they want it to go. So there's lots of different uh, ways that they can modify these. They can even add a whiteboard uh, photos draw on their, on their videos. So then what a student would do when they're ready is click on the red record and they'll talk about what they uh, are talking about. So. Uh, you know, I learned that sponsored content means that someone has gotten paid money to publish some information on their website. And an example of that is the Daily Beast, where I found some articles that are news articles, and then I found some other articles that are clearly just trying to sell me something, and that's sponsored content. Um, I'm not sure what I think about it yet. Uh, I think obviously people need to make money, but I sometimes just want to be able to go to a site and know that it's reliable and that I'm not being sold something. Okay, so then when the student's ready, they click on the check cord and they'll talk about what that was like an edit screen. Okay, then it's going to pull up uh, a little thumbnail image. They click submit and it's processing the video, telling me I have a slow internet connection because I'm using up the the whole thing with my my streaming here. And then once a student is, uh, once that video is posted, which just might take a little while, unfortunately, because of my internet, um, you will be able to see that uh, directly in the assignment. Um, so their video will pop up right there. So as that's loading, I'll double check here and see if there are any questions uh, while we're waiting for that.
Yeah. So yeah, Diane, I, I definitely agree. That's a great point. Um, they can do this on virtual days. This would be a great, you know, uh, lesson that you have students do after they've learned some content, they're in the classroom with you, they've built that knowledge collectively, and then you're going to send them out to do this independent work uh, where they create a video. So yeah, that's a great idea. Glad you brought that up. Okay. Awesome. Yes, Terry, they can do that too. Um, I didn't, sh I didn't show that, but yes, that's another option. And actually that's a more fun option. So thank you for bringing that up as well that, uh, they can bring out, uh, bring up like, uh, an emoji sticker that they would put over their face instead of the pixelation. Um, and there's other things they can add hats and stuff like that. So, uh, you, you'll be amazed if you haven't used it, it's definitely going to bring a smile to your face because students do really funny things with the videos. Okay. Yeah, and Tammy, this is great. I, I love Flipgrid for this reason too, uh, getting to know your classmates. It's, it's such a great tool for that. Um, I like to do an activity where I have students ha uh, record a video about something that others wouldn't know about them. And then the assignment is they have to go and find somebody that has something similar to them, um, you know, rather than just kind of sharing, what do you, what do you like to do outside of school or something um, to share about what is something, you know, person you think people wouldn't know about you uh, by looking at you. And you'd be surprised students go pretty deep um, on that and, you know, can make connections with each other uh, that way. So um, it's, it's a format that students are probably more familiar with using and sharing with each other uh, more familiar than, than we are even. Okay. It looks like this video showed up on the red record and they'll talk about what they uh, are talking about. So, uh, you know, I learned that sponsored content means that someone Sorry has gotten that. paid money to publish some information on their website. And an example of that is the Daily Beast, where I found some articles. Okay, so let's go back over here. And now that the student has posted, I'm able to see the student response that you were just on the end record in the background. And students, when they log in, can also watch each other's videos um, and they can respond to each other uh, via video. And now, actually just today, uh, was uh, released the ability to respond to each other via text. So now um, it doesn't have to be a video response um, they can also respond just with a text comment, um, and you can as well. So I'm, I'm glad they added that option because sometimes it can be a little bit challenging to have students go and record video responses unless you actually set that up as, as another segment of the lesson, which we are actually going to do here. Um, okay. So I know we're coming, coming to the end of the hour. Um, but we just have. Uh, this last section now, which is the evaluate section. Now, traditionally evaluate is going to be a quiz or a test, and you could absolutely turn something like this into a more traditional evaluation where you're having students uh, take a quiz um, and show, you know, apply that learning in, in that kind of format. Um, I also like to ha do evaluation in different ways. Um, and one of those uh, strategies is to do peer evaluation. Uh, so for um, this peer evaluation, you could have it be more formal where they actually have to fill in a rubric and communicate that feedback. You could also have it be just more in, of an informal evaluation where you're having students go in. They have to watch two of their classmates' responses here um, on Flipgrid. And if you really wanted to control it, you could even assign who has to uh, watch whose specific video. At the very least, I would communicate, you need to go uh, make sure you're not responding to a student that already has a response just to kind of spread that out. Um, and what they'll do when they respond is name something that they found interesting. And then they could also essentially name a plus and a delta. So what's something you did well and what's something that you could improve upon. And again, just like when you create the basic prompt for Flipgrid, the more specific you can be uh, for students about what they need to say when they're responding, the higher quality those videos are going to be. And I do usually make a point 
of basically deleting a bunch of student videos initially when they respond and telling them that it doesn't it doesn't cut it uh, it doesn't meet the standard of of what an academic response should be because i've found that if i don't kind of uh, take the reins early like that um, then sometimes the responses are just like silly and not all that high quality but if you kind of put your foot down and say you know that you're holding a certain standard for what they need to be um, then they tend to do the right thing from there on out okay so that's the end of that lesson and again uh, this lesson plan is going to be in the um, description for this video when it posts uh, usually the day after so it'll post tomorrow morning if you do have any questions for me uh, best way to get a hold of me is through email at uh, newedtechclassroom at gmail.com. And I'm gonna stay on right now and answer any questions. So if people have questions that you'd like to have answered, go ahead and put those in the chat. And I'm also going to try to address some uh, different questions that I haven't uh, addressed yet. Okay, so yeah, Jim, this question, this is about Flipgrid. Uh, do student videos come back to the teacher or do they get shared with everyone in the class? Um, you can set it up in the same way, same way we did with Padlet where you can moderate the videos so you see them first, but the idea with Flipgrid is that they all get shared with the rest of the class. It's a, essentially like a collaboration tool. Um, so you could set it up so they only came to you and you never approved them, but the, the idea is that they would go uh, for everybody to see. It's a great question. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so it looks like I have most of the questions, I'll still continue to look through them and see if there's anybody else um, whose question I, I haven't addressed yet. And I'll go ahead and stay in the chat and even after the video finishes, see if there are any questions that I haven't answered and see if I can answer those in the chat. But um, we're just at the hour, so managed to, to squeeze it in here. Um, so. Thank you so much for coming and I'll be doing this again next Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Always looking for suggestions as well about either programs or specific types of lessons that you would like to see. Uh, so if you have any suggestions, great place to put those would be in the comments for this video um, and that will give me some ideas about what to plan for the future. So thank you so much and uh, thanks for sticking around. Thank you everybody who asked a question. Um, it was uh, a little little bumpy in some places there, but that's that's teaching online. So uh, we all we all go through it and uh, you know just uh, remember, I know I said this in the last one, but remember we are in this crazy emergency situation right now and everyone I know is is putting in you know way more than hundred percent best effort. So um, keep it up. You know, the fact that you showed up for a Thursday night lesson like this to learn about some new practices and improve upon your practice just shows your commitment and dedication to your students. They're so lucky to have you. I hope you have a great week and I hope to see you next week as well.